All right, we're here, CSEP National Conference at breakfast. I'm about to speak to everyone. The room's gonna be filled with probably about 500 people. Uh, if you know me, this is one of my biggest fears. And the reason I say yes to this stuff is because I think if you're not good at something, you have a fear of something, you have to go out and do it. Uh, so, got a bit of a presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself, what I've done, my training methodologies, my recovery, all of that. Um, and go from there, it's pretty cool. There's some of my old professors in the room, some of my old classmates. So. Um, pretty cool full circle moment, but wish me luck. Get out there and do something that scares you. I think something uh, that I want to speak about before I actually get to the presentation itself uh, is that I did, uh, like Zach said, I did my formal education, part of it over in Australia. I had experience with that system, and I really knew nothing about the Canadian system. And I think one of the cool things, and, and why I'm so appreciative to be here, is because I looked at uh, the, the mission statements of kinesiology, of CSEP, uh, of all of the options available. Uh, and this is the stuff that really resonated with me. So first and foremost, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, and I always say, although I get pulled away a lot for the other things that I do, this is really where my, my joy and my heart lies. So becoming world's strongest man, a lot of guys have a story, a lot of people have a story when they're professional athletes that uh, I saw this as a kid, I dreamed to be world's strongest man, or I dreamed to play in the NHL, the NFL. Um, and for me, this really just wasn't the case. So as a kid, uh, back when I had hair, uh, that's 13 is when it started to go, unfortunately. Um, I loved golf, and golf was my, my number one love. Uh, like Zach said, I went up and played football at the University of Guelph, and then I worked with the KW Titans. Now, the interesting thing, when I was becoming a strength and conditioning coach and going through my undergrad, I thought that the coolest thing that I could possibly do is work with professional athletes. I landed a job that I thought was going to be a dream job, and I thought that there was probably just a bit more uh, impact that I could make in the world. And I thought, I've always been active, so there's really no way for me to be able to relate to people who haven't been active, and the only way that I could do that is if I push myself in different ways physiologically. And that's what took me to running. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try to push myself aerobically and see how aerobically fit I could get. Uh, I ran the three marathons, I was okay. Uh, and then I moved to Australia, started powerlifting, that transitioned into strongman. But the intention of this all was really just to experience what other people experience. So I think there's some students in the room, I think the number one thing that I could probably pass on to you is whatever you're asking someone to do, just make sure that you've tried to experience that yourself in one way or another. And I was moving back to Canada. I was moving back because my intention when I left was to get formal education and exercising people with chronic injuries, conditions, to bring that back, to open a clinic, to open something really so that people like my family could be able to experience benefits from exercise as medicine. Uh, and so my plan was to move back to Canada, open the clinic, and I actually wanted to start training for triathlons. I thought that could be a next fun thing to do. Uh, and then I got a surprise invite to World's Strongest Man. At World's Strongest Man, for those of you who know Brian Shaw, um, he's a friend of mine now, so I like to tell everyone this. I broke his 13-year uh, his streak of winning the group stage. Uh, I won the group stage, I ended up coming eighth, and the rest is history. I've been on 11 podiums since then in a row. Uh, I haven't missed one, and now my entire life revolves around lifting weights, uh, which definitely was not at the career fair, but I am uh, extremely thankful for. Now, one of the points of interest, I think, in terms of, say, the high-performance side of things, is that it's really not as special as you might think, going from marathon runner to world's strongest man. So these are really the five ways in which I did that. Uh, number one is progressive overload. I don't think we can get away from that. And progressive overload applied, I think, is th there's nuance to it. Um, but the simple idea of doing a little bit more each week than the last over a period of time uh, is really what got me there in three years. For me, I say between 2 and 5% increases every week. That being said, progressive overload, I think, is too simplified when we talk about it just in the context of load intensity and volume. I think we also have to think about it in movement quality, in time under tension, in modifying rest times. Number two would be respecting the nervous system, so never going more than four to five weeks at a time before deloading, taking 30% off of the loads, taking 50% off of the sets, and allowing the soft tissue to catch up to the active tissue in terms of recovery and resiliency. And that's how I've stayed healthy over the past few years as well. One really special thing where my worlds come together is I just focus on basic movement patterns. So when I went to World's Strongest Man in 2022, uh, 
I didn't really plan to become world's strongest man. And I got this invite, so I thought, okay, I'm going to train for it. In the heats, I was great. I, I knew all the events, I had done all the events, uh, but I didn't have the equipment uh, for a lot of the things that were in the finals. So when I pulled a city bus at 2022 World's Strongest Man, the first time I learned was in the parking lot the night before with the director who's never done strongman in his life. Uh, we did barbell push press. Every single guy did it behind their back because that's stronger. I was out of a commercial gym. I was the only guy to do it in front of my neck because I had no way to train it behind my neck. I I'd never done something called power stairs before. So I really, I, I didn't have the necessary equipment, but I just focused on basic fundamental movement patterns. Now, the interesting thing where my life comes together and my performance and the health comes together is strongman is just who is the strongest person in everyday life. Basically the strongest farmer for 60 seconds, 30 seconds at a time. And all we do is we push, pull, overhead press, squat, hinge, and carry. Those six things are what we need to do to live life. And those six things are the fundamentals of what I use to be world's strongest man. So what I like to say is regardless of who you're working with, whether it's a high performance athlete or an elderly lady, if you're not trying to make them the world's strongest man, then you're probably making a mistake. Next is common sense warmups. Uh, there's, there's nothing unique that you would see if I was going into the gym. My two principles are that my body temperature is up enough that I'm sweating a bit and that I do a few sets warming up to the working set in whatever movements I'm doing for the day. Last is simple recovery. I don't go into ice baths. I don't do saunas. I don't go for massage. I don't go to physio. My recovery, more often than not, is just going for a walk. And active recovery for me is the number one thing that I've used. This is unique to a lot of people because you think high performance and you think every single thing that you're going to be doing is going to be cutting edge science, you know, just came out yesterday type of information. But I think what we have to appreciate is that information that just came out yesterday or has just come out new is something that may or may not be tried and tested over time and that we might be debating the final two or 3% of the literature when you're probably missing the first 96 or 97%. The three things that I talk about for recovery is one, your sleep and your sleep uh, uh, quality and your sleep length. Uh, number two is your nutrition and your hydration. And number three is managing your life stress. And for me, those three things are the only things that I focus on to be able to recover my nervous system as best as I can. Now, there is one thing that I do uh, that's more cutting edge, so I thought I'd bring that up today. And this is a, a recovery product, or sorry, a performance product called Airwave. Now, this is a mouthpiece and very different to a mouth guard. Uh, my story with this is that it got sent to me in the mail. And a lot of stuff gets sent to me in the mail, which is very strange. <laughs> but this came to my house five weeks before the Arnold's. I took a look at it. I didn't know where it came from. It was around Christmas time, so I thought maybe it was a present from a fan or something. And I put this thing in and workout one, I was stronger. And I thought the, the science part of me said like, okay, like great that it works for me. Placebo is a wonderful thing. Hopefully this lasts. So I used that through my prep for the Arnold's, ended up winning the Arnold, used it through my prep for the Worlds and ended up winning Worlds. Now the interesting thing about this is it's not something that's big, gets in the way that you can't breathe. It's just a little thing that you pop on the bottom of your mouth and you're able to then do a little bit more. So I thought, okay, surely this is not real. And actually I went to their website first and on their website, they had research posted, uh, which talked about improved strength performance. There's a lot to do with jaw clenching and increased power production in the lower body. There's a lot to do with uh, improved oxygen consumption when you exercise. Uh, and I, I thought that that was, really interesting, and I, I thought to myself, but great job, guys. You, you got some people to do research for you and post it on your website. But I went and looked on my own. And this is the only thing that I would say that I use that is outside of the norm that allows me to do what I do. So a simple little mouthpiece, you pop that in, it molds to your mouth, and then you're able to increase your power output in a way that doesn't restrict your breathing doesn't restrict your ability to perform. So if there's one little tidbit in terms of performance, in terms of ability for um, you and your clients to get the most from your training, this product is something that's dramatically changed 
how I look at accessory products. And like I said, this is the one thing that I use that is probably more on the cutting edge science of things and um, really helps me to do what I do. Now, the other thing, back to Strongman, the other thing that I think that has really helped me over time is that I take a, a more health-focused approach to uh, everything that I do uh, because in the end, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Um, I, I own a, a clinic in my hometown. I'll talk to you in a second, but I don't want to stand up here and be a 400-pound guy. There's a reality to being 320 pounds where it's not the healthiest thing in the world. Uh, but in being relatively healthy, I don't get hurt as much. I can recover better. I keep my aerobic fitness relatively good, not like the old days. Uh, but this is the one thing for me that it's all about. So I'm wearing my shirt, lift heavy, be kind. And I really want to change the motto for everyone who's out there who's getting into the gym and maybe is intimidated by people like me who are lifting heavy weights or even people like you guys who are all competent in the gym. Uh, and maybe that makes them feel as though they're not welcome in the space. Um, and so the real mission here is to inspire as many people to be the healthiest version of themselves in body and in mind. We take 20% of our profits and we give it back to locally owned gyms to try to continue to promote health and well-being using movements as medicine. Thank you very much, guys, for, uh, for listening to that. I'm more than happy to take some questions. Um, but thank you, and thank you very much for all the work that you do. Uh, I started powerlifting not too long ago. I can only squat about half of what you deadlifted on that screen there. Um, but I did have a question about the conjugate style system and what you think about that uh, max effort days and dynamic effort days, and whether or not there's some legitimacy to that training approach, uh, accommodating resistance, band work, things like that. The one thing that I would say is. I, I just, I always say that I'm really lucky. And people say that uh, in terms of winning World's Strongest Man, people say that you know, you're discrediting yourself by saying that. But if you know the proportion of genetics that it takes to accomplish something of the magnitude that I have, I can't really take credit from my mom and my dad. Um, so I think the goal for me and the goal for everyone getting involved in trying to be, become the strongest version of themselves should just be like, chase what you're genetically capable of. Just try to get a little bit better each day. Now, when it comes to conjugate, style programming, is there legitimacy? I mean, of course, like Louis Simmons ran a, a massively successful uh, gym based off of that. Um, I think uh, that the, the foundations of that were based on equipped lifters. And I think it's one of those things that if you're really prepared to tear muscles off the bone, to get injured and just go, does my body have it or does it not? You can go that way for a relatively decent period of time. And to be honest, when you first start into strength sports, you could do virtually anything that you're working hard and you can make great progress for the first 18 months. The thing is, if I were to try to do something like that, my nervous system would be absolutely destroyed. And I think everyone will get to that point where you're strong enough that your nervous system, it, it adapts to an extent. But in the end, like I got the same brain and nervous system that I had when I was running marathons. And if that starts to get fried, that's what we gotta be most careful of. So I think it's one of those things, if you wanna push the, the pedal to the metal, great, you can do that for a period of time. And if that period of time lasts you to becoming something incredible world champion, then fantastic, but it's certainly not a guarantee in any way. I'm much more in favor of a, a more of an undulating type of uh, periodization. I'll have times a year that I do higher rep work. I'll have times a year that I taper into my one rep maxes. I think that's, um, that's a more productive approach, uh, particularly if we want to talk about basic muscular tension model of hypertrophy. What do you think should be done at an institution level to help prepare students to be like the best CEPs they can be, other than courses designed to help you write your CEP or CPT? I'll just give a bit of my personal experience. And I think the University of Guelph prepared me really, really well academically to be out in the professional world. Uh, but frankly, I did no hands-on experience at Guelph. Uh, so I think that's, that's one definite starting spot. Now in Australia, they have mandatory big chunks of time where you have to go into clinic, you have to work as a assistant. And it, it's not a situation where you go, because I know we do have that sometimes, it's not a situation where you go in and you just fucking ultrasound, whatever, for six, eight hours a day. It's you're one-on-one -on -one with an EP and they're teaching you things as you go. When you graduate that program, you leave with the certification because it goes through all of the requirements. And I know that there's some college programs here where you come out with a CSEP 
uh, PT certification. But if the course is based around you come out with this certification because you've had this hands-on experience, because you've had this mentorship, because you've had this education, then it's so easy for a student to say like, okay, well, great. Then uh, that's something that I could do. But it brings me back to what percentage of jobs for CEPs right now do we have that are actually what we went to university to do? Uh, so few. And you're very close to exactly like, that's the thing. But that's the public system and limited by public funding. We need to show students that there are opportunities out there, there are jobs out there, and, and there's a, a whole economy where you can not just participate, but you can thrive as a practitioner in private practice, not reliance on government giving you money, because frankly, the government could pull it and who's in Trudeau or Polivier, and who cares? If, you, if you're private practice and you're showing students that people want this, people need this, to me, when I went to school, to my undergrad for human kinetics, that's what I thought that I was being promised. That's what I thought existed out there. And so I think we need to do that. And if I was thinking, what would I do today? I would force every student who's in human kinetics or kinesiology to go into some type of entrepreneurial course. And okay, it's not out there for you. No one else is doing it for you in, in large scale. So here's how you could do it for yourself. Here, here is how you could market exercise to people. Because really, I think if, if I was running a, an implementation conference for how CEPs could move forward, I would have 25% researchers uh, in physiology, I'd have 25% researchers in psychology, I'd have 25% practitioners, and I had 25% business and marketing people, because that's really what it's gonna take to show people that this is a thing that, that can exist in droves. And then once that side starts to exist, then the public system will continue uh, to follow, in my opinion. And if they don't, then fine, we got a whole public system there. But I think we need to, as, as practitioners, as professionals, as professors, as, as say doctorate students, whatever it may be, we need to show them that there are actually career opportunities out there for them, not to make 45 grand a year, but to make 70 grand, 80 grand, something you could actually live on. So with that being said, thank you very much for having me guys. Um, in terms of pictures and whatever I'm around, don't be shy, more than happy, um, more than happy to have a chat as well. Um, but uh, in 10 short years, I went from listening to my professors diligently to you having to listen to me. So it's a great full circle moment. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. That was cool. Thank, thank you. you. Love that. Thanks. Thanks.